Thank you all for being here for the first annual meeting of the Free Rod Blagojevich Committee. <laughs> and I uh, can see you're all eager to join. Um, we are very pleased uh, to be a part of this. Uh, this is a, a joint partnership of the Truman Library uh, and the Kansas City Public Library. This space, the Truman Forum, is a partnership of the Truman Library uh, and the Kansas City uh, Public Library. Uh, the Truman Forum is, uh, I think you'll, you'll agree, uh, one of the great spaces in our, our, our city. We're, thank you. Uh, we're grateful to the Kauffman Foundation in particular for being the lead funder of, the, of, this, of this space. We're very excited about, about the ongoing nature of this partnership and, and, and two of the, uh, two of the I, we hope, are the important institutions in this town coming together uh, to work on, uh, on exciting events like today's uh, event. Um, I do, uh, and I want to say a special thanks to, uh, uh, to Alex Burden, who is, Alex Burden, sorry, who, who, is, who has been such a, uh, a joy to work with uh, at the Truman Institute, Truman Library Institute. Um, you know, Harry Truman wasn't himself known uh, for his Supreme Court appointments. In fact, if you look at the Wikipedia entry, they quote a scholar referring to them as inexcusable. Um, but he was known for what he did in civil rights. Uh, he started in many ways, at least from a presidential, from a Washington Beltway point of view, he started the civil rights movement uh, in this country, and I think we can all be proud of that. And so it's, a, it's an honor to be a, a part of uh, this program uh, today. And it's also an honor for me to introduce the, uh, the person, a member of the Truman Library Board and Executive Committee, uh, who will be introducing uh, Justice Breyer today. Um, Herb Kahn, uh, a well-known Kansas City lawyer. It's my job today in my introduction basically to tell you the many activities, reasons, and events that have kept Herb off the Supreme Court. <laughs> Sorry, Herb and I have this little thing that we do together. Um, Herb, Herb has been uh, uh, chairman of Kay Barnes's mayoral transition team. The Charter Review Commission in 2000 uh, was the, the behind-the-scenes mover and shaker of uh, the creation of uh, uh, the Power and Light District and the Sprint Arena. Um, he's, chairman, he's been chairman of the Board of Trustees of the Kansas City Art Institute and member of the, uh, the Civic uh, Council. Uh, and he's most recently been chairman of the Blue Ribbon Task Force uh, studying uh, and making recommendations on the uh, unfortunately underfunded pension plans of the city of uh, Kansas City. Um, you know, you might refer to Herb as a Kandu kind of guy. I don't know. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Uh, he's, he's, won, he's won many awards. My two favorite awards that, that he's, he's run are the Baron of the Boardroom Award uh, and the uh, Best Rainmaker in Missouri Award, which will give you uh, some idea of her uh, talent and, and importance uh, uh, in our city. So it's, it's a pleasure to uh, introduce my friend Herb Kahn. Thank you very much. And if we didn't have a Supreme Court justice waiting in the wings, I would respond to Crosby, but I won't. Thank you all for being here. Thank you for being part of a, uh, an overflow crowd, maybe the largest crowd we've ever had for an event here. And if that's not true, it certainly is the largest crowd we've ever had for a Thursday afternoon 2 p.m. event. Uh, as you know, the Kansas City Library and the Truman Library uh, have partnered for this and many other stimulating events. And but for what Crosby has done in the past seven years, this partnership probably uh, would not exist. This Truman Forum would not exist, and the many other programs sponsored by the Kansas City Library System uh, would not be taking place. So Crosby, seriously, on behalf of a grateful community, thank you. You, you, you may re you want more Crosby stuff? <laughs> you may recall that uh, last April, Justice Breyer had to cancel his appearance at the Wild About Harry event. Our honorary chairs for that evening were two of our outstanding attorneys in Kansas City, Bert Bates and Ed Matheny, and they did a really uh, wonderful job in rallying the legal community to support that very successful event and the Truman Library Institute also wishes to sincerely thank Bert and Ed. Thank you. Okay. 
One more introduction, and then we'll get to the justice. The chairman of the board of the Truman Library Institute is Mary Hunkler. She's sitting in the front row. Mary, thank you for all that you do for the library. And, and speaking of the Truman Library, come visit. It, it is, by many accounts, the finest presidential library in the United States. It is constantly being renovated. New exhibits are there. And you're about, as you're sitting right now, you're about 20 to 25 minutes away from it. So come see it. It's really worthwhile. So here's the question that I have for you. What is a really good way to introduce a justice of the United States Supreme Court? And I think rather than using the usual resume information, you might be more interested in hearing some of the personal and different aspects of Justice Breyer's life. So I will not mention some of the very impressive background information. For example, I will not tell you <laughs> that he has degrees from Stanford, from Oxford, and from Harvard. I will not be reporting to you that he was a law clerk for Justice Arthur Goldberg on the Supreme Court, and I will not tell you that he taught at Harvard and taught courses in Sydney, Australia, as well as the University of Rome. And although it's interesting, I probably will not tell you about his appointment by President Jimmy Carter to the First Circuit Court of Appeals, and that means I will not be telling you that he was confirmed by the Senate by an overwhelming vote of 80 to 10. And since I didn't tell you about that, there is no reason to tell you about his appointment to the United States Supreme Court by President Bill Clinton or that he was confirmed by an even more lopsided vote of 87 to 9. It goes without saying that I will not list all of the highly influential books Justice Breyer has written or the key role that he has played in developing the federal sentencing guidelines, which are now used in almost all criminal cases. Well, I probably should mention his latest book, Making Our Democracy Work, A Judge's View, which will be available for sale after the program and for autographing by Justice Breyer. So now that you know what I'm not going to be telling you about, let me tell you some personal facts that I think you might find more interesting. Justice Breyer grew up in San Francisco and, among other activities, became an Eagle Scout. Justice Breyer has a younger brother who is not only also an Eagle Scout, but is today a federal district court judge. I was interested in knowing that in high school, he was an excellent debater, and an opponent of his in one of those debates is now governor of California, Jerry Brown. Maybe sometime during his address this afternoon, Justice Breyer will tell us who won that debate. <laughs> Justice Breyer is married to the Honorable Joanna Frieda Hare from uh, Great Britain. The Breyers have three adult children, and one of those children is an Episcopal priest. Now, isn't that a lot more interesting than the material I decided not to tell you about? <laughs> Let me end on a, on a more serious note. You may recall that at the last State of the Union address when President Obama was criticizing the Supreme Court decision of Citizens United. One of the other justices uh, did not agree with that and stated he would not attend future State of the Union addresses. And I want to read to you what Justice Breyer said about that. I think, and this is a quote, I think it's very, very important, very important for us to show up at the State of the Union because people today are more and more visual. What people see in front of them at the State of the Union is the federal government. And I would like them to see the judges too, because federal judges are also a part of that government. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm now, now getting ready to say what I've been wanting to say since last April. It's the privilege of the Truman Library Institute to present the Honorable Justice of the Supreme Court and a really good guy, the Honorable Stephen Breyer. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.
<laughs> glad, glad you didn't tell them about those earlier books I've written. I mean, they're pretty academic. You can see my career was pretty academic. One of those books about regulation uh, got into the hands of a popular reviewer, I, I don't know how, in the LA Times, and for some reason totally surprising to me. He, he wrote a review of it in the LA Times, and this is, he starts off and he says, uh, in Alice in Wonderland, uh, the Dormouse uh, and Alice emerge from the pool of tears, and the Dormouse starts reading from Hume's History of England. Well, why are you doing that, says Alice. Well, says the Dormouse, uh, we're wet, and this is the driest thing I know. He says, well, that was, that was before Breyer wrote this book. He said, that, now, now I've maybe reformed, uh, I, uh, I hope, in, in these more recent things. I'm sorry I got here so late. Uh, it took six and a half hours to fly here from Washington, you know, so I could spend my whole time, you know, watching that little placard advertising in front of me. It says, United Express, it says Express, you know. <laughs> Is that, is that, that's a, a name or a forlorn hope, I don't know. But, but uh, in any case, I did get here and I missed the Truman Library, which is a very sad thing for me. I wanted to check on the stories that I'd heard. I mean, one of them I really wanted to check up on was after President Truman apparently, apocryphally, perhaps, uh, uh, lost the steel seizure case, which he didn't expect to lose, and he lost it. It was a big loss for him. He still went over to uh, one of the judges' uh, uh, dinner parties and uh, the uh, justice said to him, well, he said, oh, Mr. President, I'm, I'm, I'm glad to see you here. I'm a little surprised you came. He said, uh, he said well, uh, given what we've written. <laughs> he said, well, I don't like your decisions, however, but I love your whiskey. He said, There's, <laughs> a, I don't know. I could have checked up on that. And, and uh, what, what have I done? I mean, that's another person told me that, but I remember another one of these apocryphal stories. I'm sure this is a lie. But he said that uh, an archaeologist friend of his had, had found a, a tablet from Ur 10,000 years ago, and it said uh, when they translated it, everything is going to rack and ruin. The buses uh, don't run on time, uh, children don't obey their parents, and uh, every man is writing a book, it said. So wh why, why, why did I write this book? Uh, and the reason, I'll tell you, is uh, more seriously, is I wrote a book about the court. I've written two, actually. This is the recent one. is really designed to transmit uh, to people who aren't judges and who aren't lawyers, and contrary to popular belief, there are 308 million Americans who are not lawyers, <laughs> uh, and uh, to transmit to them what it is we do. Now, why? Why do that? Uh, because I think we are in an era where people are pretty cynical about the government. And there is some cause, perhaps, but if people become too cynical, well, then they won't have a government. And they won't understand that they are the government, and they won't do it, and who knows what will happen. Well, I can't cure that problem, but I can do my bit. And it seems to me my bit is to try to explain to people, not just I could just I do my job, but I mean I have a little extracurricular here, and the extracurricular can be trying to explain to people what we do. Now that's, of course, not as easy as it sounds. Why? People are busy. I mean, the person I want to explain it to is the man or the woman who's going into the supermarket, and uh, you go, go talk to that woman. I mean, if you can, because she has three children, and they're at home, and dinner has to be prepared, and there are two jobs, and the bills are up to here, and uh, uh, they don't have time. And uh, if I come along and try to make too big a speech, well, thank you very much, it's really nice of you, but I do have other things to do. But suppose I could get her attention, just for a fairly short time, maybe even a couple of hours if I'm really lucky, how do I get across the essence of what goes on in my institution, the Supreme Court, which is also your institution? How do I do that? And that's what the problem of the book is. And what I've done is I've taken two parts of it, and I sort of take the easier part first because it's more interesting. <laughs> and uh, it's sort of like uh, you know, a spoonful of sugar helps the medicine go down. <laughs> and then the, the second part is a little bit more technical. But in that, and I pose two questions that I think people might have about the court. Now, I'll tell you the first question. I'll summarize the first part a little bit, and then I'll tell you what the second part is about. I mean, the first part really responds to a question. To see the question, you have to ask a more fundamental question, and that is this. Why should nine unelected people 
these nine judges, why should they have the power to set aside a law of Congress? People who are elected, after all, by the voters to pass laws. How did we ever get the power to say that such a law or a law passed by the legislature in a state or in Congress is unconstitutional? Now, that is a question that really bothered uh, Alexander Hamilton and the founders. I mean, many people think, oh, John Marshall made this power up in a case uh, called Marbury versus Madison, but he didn't. He didn't. I mean, it was all around. A consensus of the framers thought that the court would have the power to strike down a law of Congress that ran contrary to the Constitution. And in one of the Federalist Papers, Federalist 78, uh, Hamilton explains why he thinks that's a good idea. And his explanation, which I'll paraphrase or parody a little bit, but his explanation is simply this. He says, well, here is the document. He says, I've worked on this document, and Mattis and I and a few others have written this thing, and it's beautiful. It's fabulous. And he's absolutely right in that. It is fabulous. It is beautiful. No question about that. He says, but how do I know people will follow it? If there is no one, no group of people, who can try to keep the government of the country on the rails and that's what's in here. It's rails, it's the borders, it's the boundaries. If, they, if there's no one who can say when they go beyond the boundary, when they get off the rails, well then let's take this beautiful document and uh, well, it, no, it, won't, it won't have any effect. We'll hang it up in a museum. It's beautiful. We'll hang it up in the National Gallery. Well, actually did not say that because there was no National Gallery at that time. But uh, you see the point. He said it wouldn't be effective. He says somebody ought to have the authority to keep this government on the rails, the constitutional rails. Well, who should that be? Well, if, he says, it's the president, and the president has the authority to say when anybody does anything constitutional, unconstitutional, then he'll become a tyrant because he'll be able to ratify his own actions all the time. He has too much power anyway, not the president. Well, what about Congress? Congress, after all, is uh, elected. Why shouldn't they have the power? And he said, that is a good question. But the reason I think they shouldn't have that power is the following. He says, Congress, he says, this, the, this document is designed to give the same rights to the least popular people in the United States as it gives to the most popular people. The rights they have here are identical. Now, Congress, well, Congress is an expert on popularity. I mean, believe me, they know popularity. <laughs> and if they didn't, they wouldn't be where they are. All right. Well, all right. They're fine as long as what they're doing is popular. But can we really expect they'll hold something unconstitutional when doing so is very unpopular, particularly their own law, which they passed because it was popular? He says, maybe. Sometime, but I have my doubts. Well, so who's left? Well, he says, here we have over here these judges. Who are these judges? He says, I don't know. Fabulous. Nobody's ever heard of them. He says, not only have these sort of gray bureaucrats, nobody's ever heard of them, but they don't have the power of the purse and they don't have the power of the sword. Wonderful. They're weak. And the job of interpreting the Constitution is, after all, something of a legal job, which they're supposed to know something about. So we'll give them the power. Unknown persons, no purse, no sword, and sort of lawyers. I mean, they are lawyers. They're, they're even judges. Well, that's Federalist 78. Parodied, but there's something to it. And uh, that means he didn't ask the next question. And it's this next question that I want to ask. I mean, if these people are so weak, no purse, no sword, if nobody's ever heard of them, and if they're up there to do things that at least sometimes are very unpopular, well, when they do these very unpopular things, why will anybody do what they say? I mean, that's the question. It's Hotspur's question in Henry IV. 
You know, in Henry IV, in comes Hotspur and Owen Glendower. Owen Glendower is a Welshman. In Shakespeare, all Welshmen are mystics. So the first thing that happens is Owen Glendower says, I can summon spirits from the vasty deep. Well, says Hotspur, so can I, the practical Englishman. So can I, so can any man. But will they come when you do call for them? <laughs> and that's the question. Now, that is a question that I get all the time. I mean, I do today. And I get it from judges in Africa who come from Asia, who come from Latin America, who come because they want to see the court. And one of the questions I'm bound to get is, why do people do what you say? Because that's a problem they're having. And I say, I'd like to say it's because of the document. And it is in part. It is in part because it really is written in general terms, but they're specific enough to affect control and they can adapt over time. And uh, there are values written into this document that we have today just as they had in the 18th century. And so it's a wonderfully written document, but that's not the whole story. Because I can't answer your question without telling you a few stories. Because it's really history that answers the question, not a theory and not some words in the document. And I want to tell them some stories. I want to tell them how when the first, the first after all, the first instance where the court asserted the power, asserted the power to declare a law of Congress unconstitutional was in, as I just said, Marbury versus Madison, which is what you know. And John Marshall, that was a brilliant case because he was the Houdini of the judicial system. Why the Houdini of the judicial system? Well, the case was a little technical, but it really involved whether the President of the United States, Thomas Jefferson, uh, had to give uh, a commission to be a judge to a man called Marbury, who had been appointed actually earlier by Adams, and Jefferson didn't want to do it. And not only did Jefferson not, not want to do it, but Jefferson didn't like John Marshall all that much, and he didn't want to do anything John Marshall told him to do, who was a Federalist and he was a Republican or a Democrat. Uh, and uh, he didn't really believe very much in the power of the Supreme Court. So Marbury brings his case to court, and John Marshall sits there, and Jefferson sitting up in the White House is thinking, ha ha, I have him now. Because either he has to decide for me, in which case everybody will say I'm right, or he'll decide against me, in which case I won't do what he says. And that was absolutely his plan. He did not intend to do what he said. And that would have weakened the power of the court, seriously, and strengthened the power of the presidency. And John Marshall knows it. So what did Houdini write? He wrote an opinion that says Jefferson is completely wrong. Marbury is right. Jefferson must give him the commission. But actually, we don't have the power to tell Jefferson to do that because there is a statute here that gives us power to do it, but that statute is contrary to the Constitution of the United States, and we have to follow the Constitution and overturn the statute. Now, you figure that one out. I mean, that, and when you get through that, that, that puzzle, that uh, a knot, you will see that he has done a brilliant thing. He has said, we have all the power in the world. We can, in fact, declare laws of Congress unconstitutional. Jefferson was totally wrong. But Jefferson, because of the first thing, we have that power. We don't, can't say the second. We just said it, but we can't say it. That was just like your introduction, actually. <laughs> and and uh, 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 he said, but uh, uh, you see, Jefferson, what can you do about it? You won the case. And he sits there thinking, Jeff, yeah, that's right, I did win. And he's furious. Read some of the things he wrote later. He said, Marshall's all wrong in that case, and he was sort of sputtering. Uh, he writes that to some of his allies, and uh, he's furious because the power is asserted there. And, uh, but you see what Mar my point really is that, that John Marshall is worried, and he's worried about whether the country will follow the court, and he doesn't have to worry about it in that case. And he had plenty to worry about. I like to tell my students, some, and I like to tell audiences of students, about another case that came up in 1834. That was a case in which, uh, uh, you might have heard of it. It was a case in which the Cherokee Indians had been given by treaty, by about two or three treaties, 
land in northern Georgia. It was theirs. It was not a close question. It belonged to them. And the Cherokee tribe had become hunter. They were given up hunting and fishing. They'd become farmers. And uh, they had an alphabet. And they had a constitution. And they had a great chief, Chief Ross. And everything was fine, except they had one more thing, which worked to their disadvantage. And that is they found gold. Because as soon as they found gold, the Georgians said, well, I don't see why they should have it. They're Indians. We're Georgians. We'll take it. And that's just what they did. And they took the land. Now, the Cherokees, being a civilized group of people, did what any civilized group of people would do. They hired a lawyer. <laughs> and they hired one of the best lawyers of the day, Willard Wirt. And he brought the case. And after a lot of complication, they got to the Supreme Court. And when they finally got the court to decide it, well, the court said what the law was, which is, this land belongs to the Cherokees. It does not belong to the Georgians. And uh, then the, the President of the United States, uh, Andrew Jackson, made a comment, which is uh, supposedly made a comment, uh, which may uh, trigger a bell in, the, in your mind. And that is, he supposedly said, John Marshall has made his decision. Now let him enforce it. And Andrew Jackson sent federal troops to Georgia, but not to enforce the ruling of the Supreme Court. Uh, he sent troops to evict the Indians. And they were evicted. And they traveled the Trail of Tears, so-called because so many died, along the way to Oklahoma, where their descendants live to this day. Wow. This is not a happy day in the Supreme Court's life. And it looks as if the skeptics may win out. Well, we can go forward. I mean, a lot happens in the country, and a lot happens in the court. But I like to tell the story of a case that took place about 130 years later. And uh, I, th I think this is an important instance. And uh, things are improving, but it's touch and go in these very unpopular matters. Now, we all know about Brown versus Board of Education in 1954, where the court looks at the 14th Amendment. And it says the 14th Amendment says there will be equal protection of the law. And all you had to do was look around. And, and uh, you all know this very well. And, and uh, Topeka, I was there for the ninth and uh, uh, the hundred, whatever it was, the 51st. 2004, uh, the 50th anniversary. I mean, that's where it started. That case went there. And uh, 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 Brown versus Board of Education of Topeka. And the court said these words mean what they say. Uh, legal segregation is not equal. And of course, all you had to do was open your eyes at that time, and you understood that. And uh, they said there won't be any more legal segregation in schooling and education in the United States. That's what they said in 1954. And what happened in 1955? Yeah, you're right. Nothing. I mean, next to nothing. Very, very little. And what happened in 1956? Yeah, you're right again. I mean, nothing. I mean, next to nothing. Very little. But then, in 1957, early in 1957, a federal judge in Little Rock, and some of you will remember this as, as, as I can, said that Central High School, all white, will integrate. And the ones who went there had been picked by the NAACP. They're the Little Rock Nine. And those were very brave children said, yes, we'll go. And the judge ordered that they go there in the September 1957. And at that point, Governor Faubus, whom some of us all can, can remember, who had been elected as a moderate, uh, began to say, well, I'm not so sure I'm going to permit, I'm going to permit this. And uh, uh, he said, well, you know, I have the state troops. And the judge has, well, he has, he's a judge, uh, but I have the militia. And uh, you know, he had been, uh, during that summer, the governor of Georgia had come in and said, I don't see why the citizens of Arkansas have to integrate when my citizens don't have to integrate. You know, thank you very much for that helpful remark. Uh, and uh, uh, there were a lot of white citizen council members who had come to the school. And there were crowds surrounding the school. And the governor, Falbus, gave the order, don't let the black children in the school. And on the day that integration was to take place, they came out there and they were turned away. And on one of those uh, first two days, uh, Elizabeth Eckford uh, turned around. She tried to get in, and she turned around. And on her way out, 
there, uh, a photographer, a photographer is there from all over the world, a photographer snapped a picture of her looking very dignified. But behind her was a white woman, um, face contorted with rage. And that picture went around the world. And that was not a happy story of what the United States was, um, of America was about and what it was like at that time. Well, things looked as if they were not working out too well. And then uh, Brooks Hayes, who was the congressman from uh, uh, Little Rock, phoned President Eisenhower, who was at Newport, and he agreed to meet uh, with Governor Faubus. And Governor Faubus flew up there and uh, talked to Eisenhower, and he came out, he said, uh, well, what he did was, he said, Eisenhower, he said, uh, President Eisenhower dressed me down like, a, like a, a general dresses down a sergeant. And he told Eisenhower that he would let integration go forward, and he told out, came out and told the press the opposite. Eisenhower was pretty annoyed. And the question was, well, what should he do? What should he do? And he got conflicting advice. Jimmy Burns, who had been a member of the Supreme Court but had resigned in World War II to run the war mobilization effort, he was a great friend of President Truman. He was a moderate on race, and uh, he was that, at that point governor of South Carolina. And he came to see Eisenhower, and he said uh, to Eisenhower, uh, Mr. President, if you uh, uh, want to send troops to Arkansas, he said, you better be prepared to reoccupy the entire South. He said, you will have to have a second reconstruction. Are you ready for that? He said, the best that will happen is that uh, you will uh, find they close the schools and nobody will be educated. All right. At the same time, however, Herbert Brownell, who was a very close counselor and was attorney general, very close to President Eisenhower. And, and Eisenhower had been done a good job at implementing President Truman's uh, uh, order, integrating the armed forces. He was uh, not against, I, I, at least my reading is that he was not against the integration. I think he was for it. That's my own judgment and that of quite a few historians. But Eisenhower told him, or he told Eisenhower, Brown, now you have to do something. You have to do something. And so Eisenhower at that moment decided, and he went on uh, the radio and, and he said that he had decided to send troops. And in particular, he would send the 101st Airborne. Now, every American alive at that time just about knew who the 101st Airborne was. The 101st Airborne were the heroes of Normandy. They'd parachuted into Normandy, and a lot of them had gotten hung up on the steeples where they'd just been shot down by the uh, Germans with the machine guns. And again, they were the heroes at the Battle of the Bulge. And he knew what he was doing, Eisenhower. He picked them deliberately. And he put, uh, for that reason, and he put a 1,000 parachuters parachutists on the airplanes and flew them into Little Rock and uh, the, they got off the airplane and the next day they escorted those black children into that white school. Good. That was a great day. It was a great day for uh, the rule of law. It was a great day for the cause of equality. Um, it was a great day for the United States of America. Because those pictures went around the world too. So I'd like to end the story there. But it doesn't end there. I mean, what happened next is that the, the, uh, they can't stay forever. They left after a while, the 101st Airborne. And things were not so nice at that school for those black students. Really weren't. And a segregationist school board is elected. And that segregationist board asks the court to change its order and let them uh, uh, do it a next year or the year after, or we don't know when, but sometime, who knows. And uh, that case went back up to the Supreme Court. And that's the case of Cooper versus Harris. And it would, came in over the summer of 1958. The court decided they would deal with this immediately. And they had a special hearing. And they decided to write an opinion. And that opinion said, now, no, you do not stop integrating. You will go forward with that integration right now, continue, and people are going to do this, and that's the end of it. And we all agree that Brown was right, and that's the end of it. And we sign this, all nine, which is very unusual to have nine members of the court all sign an opinion. Usually one does. And they wanted to do that to show how they all agree, which was a very good thing. I think that's a great case. 
However, there are still nine judges. And you could have had 90 judges, or 900 judges, or maybe 9,000 judges. Because the day after the Supreme Court decided that case of Cooper versus Aaron in the way I just told you, Governor Faubus closed the schools. And Central High School was closed for the rest of the year. And no one was educated. And read the future of those children in the school. There was a good article in Sports Illustrated about it not too long ago, and there are books about it. And David Bargola just wrote a book about Elizabeth Eckford and that white woman who was named Hazel Bryant. And that story is a very interesting story. I mean, she was showing off, da, 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 she was sorry, da, da, da. can they ever get back together? Can they repent? Can they? Is it possible? That's, a, that's another story, but very interesting. And what happened to the children in those schools, white as well as black? It was very tough during that year. But you see, uh, I'm an optimist, but I'm also a judge. So I like to think those paratroopers did make a difference. And I see what happened there. What happened by the end of that year is the community said, no, we're not putting up with this closed school anymore, and they voted another school board in. And that school board was a moderate school board, and, and they said, we're reopening the school. And at the same time, in that 1958 period, you began to see Martin Luther King, uh, you saw the Freedom Riders, you saw the sit-ins uh, having a little bit of effect, and it was all communities, huge, we all know what happened then. And so you say, well, did that judge's order matter? Yeah, I think so. Did President Eisenhower sending those troops in matter? I think so. But of course, I'm prejudiced. But of course, I think that that was a major step in asserting a rule of law. But look at how complicated it is. But thank goodness, the country went along. See, I love that story in part because of all the ambiguities in it and of the uncertainties, and you don't know exactly what caused what. But it ended up all right, and I, I like to tell that story. There was a, uh, uh, a, parachute, uh, a parachute general from uh, Russia who, uh, who came to our court. He came to our court because the State Department called up and said, we have this Russian parachute general who'd been in charge of pointing missiles, and they used to point them at the United States. Now they've changed direction, and we should be nice to this man. I said, OK, fine. <laughs> That's a good point. Uh, so, so he'd asked me uh, what was my, my, some of my favorite cases, and I told him about this one, just as I've told you. And I, and I, and I said, you know, that shows that the, uh, the judges and the paratroopers must be friends. <laughs> <laughs> well, so there is some point there. There is some point. But let me tell you one more case. You take your favorite, take, no, take your least favorite. And you can use any example you want, your least favorite from fairly recent years. What do you want? Abortion? Uh, prayer in schools? What about Bush v. Gore? That's a good one. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I was uh, uh, in the dissent in that, all right? But I thought it was wrong. Well, well, I heard Harry Reid in that 5-4 case discussing it. Now, Harry Reid, I suspect, is someone whom perhaps, uh, like me, thinks that was a very important case. Uh, thinks it was unpopular, and it was unpopular with at least half the country, and very, and thinks it was wrong, which is what four of us thought, all right? But he said, despite that, the most remarkable feature of that case is something that's very rarely remarked, and that is despite the fact it's important, unpopular, and wrong, the country went along, there were no riots in the streets, there were no machine guns. There were no people killing each other. There were no stones and sticks and so forth thrown. And uh, that's a treasure. That's a treasure. So when I tell that story, it depends on the audience, but the, the percentage, but I know that a certain percentage of you, perhaps, or some audiences, but they're thinking when I say that, and I say there were no riots and so forth, they're saying, and too bad there weren't a few. <laughs> So I say, okay, I understand that, I understand that. But before you reach that conclusion definitely, I'd like you to just turn on that television set and take a look at what happens in countries that decide their really serious differences in a, on the streets, with guns, and violence, instead of in a courtroom under law. And that might bring you around a bit. 
understanding why I see what I see sitting in my court and I marvel at it today exactly as I did when I was first appointed 17 years ago. A while ago. I see in front of me in that courtroom, I see people of every race, every religion, every point of view. And there they are. And there are points of view that my mother used to say that. Uh, she'd usually tell, actually, it's interesting, she'd say that to her, friend, her cousin, Sis Helsberg, who came from Kansas City. I mean, usually come out to, <laughs> to San Francisco for the holidays. She's a good cook. <laughs> and they used to get into discussions, and she'd say, you know, there is no viewpoint so crazy there isn't someone in this country who doesn't hold it. And, and then since we were in San Francisco, she'd say they all live in Los Angeles. But none, <laughs> none, 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 nonetheless, you see the point. It's true. And with 309 million people and 800 million opinions, I mean, it's not so easy to get people to live together and resolve their differences through interpretations of this document, through the document, uh, in a courtroom, where, of course, judges being human beings will sometimes be wrong in those unpopular decisions that matter often to people. See, so that's what I'm doing in the first part of this book. What I'm doing is a big commercial. It's a commercial. It's a commercial for teachers. It's a commercial for high schools. It's a commercial that says, please, just as Sandra O'Connor has been saying, will you, who have the same obligation I do, no different, help teach something about the government of the United States to those next generations who threaten to grow up a little too cynical, in my opinion. Because if they don't know how the government works, if they don't know what this document's about, if they don't know what we do in the court and those other institutions up there really do, and what's the point of electing people, and how the document, you know, makes a few decisions as to boundaries, but leaves almost all decisions up to people to decide through their elected representatives. If they don't know all that, well, then we won't have it. And that's what I tell the high school students. I say, I can't tell you how to live your life. Uh, believe me, you wouldn't pay any attention if I tried to. But uh, uh, I can't. I, I can say I hope you have a, some loving relation. I hope you have uh, a good job. And I hope that you participate in your community's life. And I can't tell you to do it. But I can tell you, see, I'm sneaking this in. I can tell you this, my work with this document convinces me that the people who wrote it think that if you do not participate in your community's life, this document isn't going to work. And I do think that. You see, I can go on endlessly on this commercial because I believe it very strongly. And it's one for people who live for us, for, for, for people who are living in a community and where they have school boards and where we have curricula and where we're trying to raise the next one or now it's my grandchildren. And uh, uh, you see the point. It's very subtle. <laughs> but that's the point of these stories. Now, I do go on to another question, which I'll just spend about five, seven, eight minutes on. Because the, if people don't, I want them to see this problem and the need to have the education broad enough. You know, it's, it's corny with your grandchildren. If you have grandchildren, you already know that. I, I mean, I could go in the next eight minutes about my grandchildren. You know, you see them, uh, Clara, nine years old, comes in singing the Star Spangled Banner. I think, oh, all right, <laughs> they're not so bad. And I find that very interesting, and you find your grandchildren, all right, you see the point there. But there's a second question. And the second question is this. If I ask you quite honestly, uh, and I'll tell you that the Supreme Court of the United States, the nine of us, uh, we're not as divided as you think. Uh, we're probably unanimous on 40% of our decisions. Uh, we're probably 5-4. Uh, on maybe 20, 25 percent. It isn't always the same five and the same four. And you'll say, yeah, but those five, four, we sort of break down in somewhat predictable ways. You say, well, as respect to that, there are awfully important ones. And why do you break down in this way? And the question is really what lurks in the back of people's mind. What is this job like? So we know what it is. It's politics. What you really are doing is deciding things on the basis of politics. What you really are 
are sort of nine junior varsity politicians. <laughs> I mean, let's face it. I know you're thinking that, or some are, or close to it. And then I say, no, 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 that isn't true. That isn't true. That isn't true. They say, naturally, you're going to say it isn't true. I say, but it isn't true. I say, well, look, politics, you don't mean politics. I, I did work, as, as, as you heard. I, I worked for Senator Kennedy for a few years in my teaching uh, career, and I was in the, uh, the Senate staff. And politics uh, there with the po real politicians it wasn't me, it was him. Uh, I mean, that's who's popular and who isn't popular and where are the votes. And are you a Republican or a Democrat? Well, I don't find that at the court. Zero, zero. You say, well, what about Bush v. Gore? I'll have, need an hour to tell you why it isn't that. But, but uh, if it were, it would be an exception. But, but, but it is. But regardless, I don't find politics in that sense in the court. And you say, oh, no, I don't really mean politics in that sense. I mean ide uh, ideology. That's it, ideology. I see you mean am I a sort of Adam Smith free enterprise uh, type or am I a... Uh, sort of Maoist uh, troublemaking type. I mean, I, uh, I say, if I find that I'm reaching a decision because I think it's sort of generally good in that sense of com consistent with an ideology like Adam Smith or the opposite or whatever, I know I'm doing the wrong thing. That isn't there either. So I say, well, well, then what? I, you can't say I'm totally wrong. That's you talking. I know I can't say you're totally wrong. So I'll say this. Um, there is a something close. It's not ideology. But well, I did grow up in San Francisco. I did go to Lowell High School, a public high school. I did go to Stanford. I uh, did. I've had the life I've had. I grew up in the 50s, and of course, uh, maybe it would have been different if I'd grown up in some other generation. But all of us, by the time we reached middle age or later, Whatever, what we begin to formulate views about our discipline, our profession, our career, and our own experience. And those views, well, you can call it a philosophy, but, but it's pretty hard, it's pretty abstract, but it's pretty hard to change. Because in, in my particular profession, you begin to develop views of what law is about and of what the country is about. And how law, including the part in the Constitution, relates to ordinary people who have to live under that law. And is it affected by my own background? Probably. Probably is. Well, can you get rid of it? No. Should you? I don't think you can jump out of your own skin, and I don't think you should. At that level of abstraction. At that level, no. You say, well, my goodness, people have different ones, sort of. I mean, these are approaches, very vague and general and so forth. And I say, yeah, that's true. So I say, well, you know, I'd had differences with people, and I found different points of view in San Francisco. I lived a lot of my life in Massachusetts. I found there were differences, but I didn't know what difference was till I came to Washington and was uh, part of the Supreme Court. My first reaction was, it's too bad everybody doesn't think like me. And, uh, and then, then my second, more mature reaction was just what we've been talking about. It's a big country. There are 309 million people. Uh, people have different points of view, and it is not a tragic thing if among nine people on the Supreme Court, they sort of come from different places. And they will tend to over time, as long as different presidents appoint different people. And if presidents, by the way, appoint a judge and they think he's already gonna, always going to decide in favor of that president's point of view, they're making a big mistake. I mean, uh, Teddy Roosevelt appointed uh, Oliver Wendell Holmes, and within three months, Holmes had come out in the dissent in a big antitrust case that Roosevelt was very in interested in, and Roosevelt said, I could appoint a judge with more backbone carved out of a banana. <laughs> I mean, he was really annoyed. And Holmes never understood why he was so annoyed. <laughs> but if you're thinking of presidents trying to appoint a person who is at some highly general level, uh, thinks very consistently with a highly general philosophy, they'll have more luck. Not 100% luck either, because they can get big surprises. But they'll have more luck, and that means that over long periods of time, since we have uh, life tenure, you know, that was Jefferson's complaint about the Supreme Court. He's at life tenure. He said, uh, the trouble with the Supreme Court is they never retire, and they very rarely die. <laughs> <laughs> but, but, uh, as long as that's so, you see, you'll get this sort of a mix, and that isn't such a terrible thing. But I want to do more than that. 
I want to explain in this second part what this sort of general approach is, and I don't want to call it a philosophy, approach is sort of better, and I want to say one what it can't be. It can't possibly be politics. Why? Well, I mean, Hamilton, remember, put us, this power, up to those nine people so they would do things that were unpopular. If they're supposed to do what's political, then give the power to Congress. They're at least real politicians. And, and if you think one of the worst things of judges acting as politicians, they're terrible politicians. They don't know what to do politically. And if you want evidence of that, go look at the Gred Scott decision. Well, the best thing that could ever be said for Tawney, which isn't much, is that he was trying by the Dred Scott decision to stop the Civil War, and if that's what he thought he started it. I mean, he had just the opposite effect that he was going to have, because Lincoln picked up the dissent in that case, and, and uh, that made a, spoke about it at the Cooper Union speech, and that helped make him head of the Republican Party, and that helped lead to the abolishing of slavery. Good thing. But anyway, they're terrible politicians. Well, what about this thing, originalism? Originalism. Now, I, I know, I mean, uh, my, my colleagues, Dino Scalia, is a very strong advocate of that, and we get on very well. The court gets on very well personally. We all like each other personally, and uh, we do. I've never heard a voice raised in anger in that conference room in the years I've been there, never. And I've never heard one member of the court say something insulting about another, uh, not even as a joke, really. No. I mean, maybe for his, for his wife or something, but I mean, <laughs> husband. <laughs> but, but not publicly, not in, not in the court, not in that conference room. But, uh, no. but uh, so we, we get on all right. But there are differences. And so if you look at this, is originalism a good candidate for an approach? Well, we debate that. We debate that publicly. And his point of view, which is not a foolish point of view, is that, that, that uh, you need uh, to look back to the framers in some depth and in detail because by doing that, we'll answer a lot of constitutional questions without referring to what he fears is the judge's subjective judgment. See, that's what he's afraid of. The judges will start substituting what each of them thinks is good for what the law says. And when I say to him, as we do, because we do discuss this, I say, you know, good flip remark, I'll say, I'm sorry, that's a wonderful idea, but you know, George Washington didn't actually know about the internet, you know. Uh, and uh, so he says, oh, that's really clever. I, I didn't know that. <laughs> you know, and he says, that isn't the point. The point is this. He said that, uh, of course, you can't always find an answer. But then he tells the joke, which is a good joke, so I'll repeat it. He, he tells the joke about the two campers who are out there, uh, and one is putting on his running shoes, and the other says, why are you putting on your running shoes? And uh, he says, because there's a bear coming after. He says, well, you can't outrun a bear. He says, yes, but I can outrun you. So, so, so his point is, you see the point. He's saying, fine, you come up with something better. All right, that's what you have here, an effort. Says, well, what is it? Well, if I get a summary form, um, our job in that constitutional area is to take values that don't change, that underlie these different provisions, you know, free speech, uh, free expression, you get an idea of what that is. That doesn't change much. But you're taking values that are here in the document and you're trying to apply them to a world that changes every five minutes. I mean, you know, airplanes, television, internet, computers, Twitter, Facebook, and then we go on from there to things I have no idea even what their names are. But, but, but nonetheless, that's the job. He says, well, how are you going to do that? I say, well, I found a very good, very good statement in Gordon Wood's book about America in the 18th century and during the Revolutionary period. And one of the things he quotes, he's a very good historian, he quotes in that book is a Connecticut judge who says the American system, the American system of, constitu of uh, appellate law, is he describes it with four words. He says it's prudence, pragmatism, reasonableness, and utility. So I say, I like those. Yeah, but so far we're still at the bumper sticker level. And uh, can we get beyond that? Can we get a little more deep than that? And I say, yeah, I think we can. I think you can say that those four words, as you're applying them, is a one thing. You're, it's, a, it's an approach that takes values. Well, values, well, the document's filled with them. That's where you get them. And I said, you try to get those values, and then you try to apply them. It's an approach that's purposive, purposive. That means when I have a statute, the first thing I look for 
Is there someone in Congress who wrote these words? What did that person have in mind? What are they trying to do? And when I can figure that out, and sometimes you can, sometimes you can't, but do your best, and you try to use that in order to get the right interpretation. All right? Values in the Constitution, try to use them, try to use those purposes. Um, it's an approach that sees the different branches of government and the states and federal government not as each other's throats all the time, but as trying to work together, oddly enough, so that you will facilitate the working of other parts of the government so that the Constitution as a whole does work. And it is an approach that is pragmatic in the following sense, that many of our cases, the most difficult ones, are not about right versus wrong. They are about right versus right. You have on the one side an answer that will further values of free expression protected by the First Amendment. And maybe they're competing with personal privacy. That was what was at issue uh, with uh, this terribly difficult case in last year uh, involving uh, some demonstrators who were out demonstrating at the funeral of a, uh, of a, uh, a, a, a veteran. A, a veteran. And uh, that was a tough one. See, and there, there, there's room there for what I'd call pragmatic balancing of the values that are at issue in the case. And you say, still, we're not much beyond the bumper sticker. Well, to get beyond that yet, I have to give examples. And I can't give them to you now because it would take too long. And uh, I want to encourage you to read them. <laughs> but uh, uh, <laughs> do I have time for one, three minutes or not? Who's keeping time? Yes? OK. OK. Um, here, here's a really tough one. I put them in forms of the court tr working with. See, the court working with Congress, that's statutory interpretation. The court working with uh, uh, the bureaucracies uh, in the federal government, that's uh, called administrative law, which uh, I, along with three other people, like because we taught it. Uh, the, uh, uh, working with the states, that's called federalism. Uh, working with past courts, that's called stare decisis. And uh, you examine all these. And, but, but one of them that is one of the most interesting and most difficult is how does the court work with the president when the president is acting with the full authority of the Constitution in an area that the Constitution makes the court have very little to do with? That's called national security. It's the president and Congress who have the national security powers. And they're the ones who know about it. But the exercise of that power tends to cut off a traditional civil liberty, which, after all, as written in this document, is an area where the court has tremendous responsibility. Now, when those things conflict, where do you go? Now, none of the things I say have clear answers. I mean, they're just approaches. But uh, I'd say we learned something from a couple of examples. The one where I felt I've learned something happened in World War II. And that was where uh, my mother told, I can remember her driving me down to Tanferan, by Tranferan Racetrack in San Francisco in probably the late 40s, and she said that's where they held the Japanese in World War II, and the voice of approval was not there in that voice. <laughs> I mean, uh, uh, what they did, well, who? DeWitt, who was the General DeWitt, was the governor of the Presidio of San Francisco, and he was the Sixth Army, he was the head of the Sixth Army, and he said, and President Roosevelt agreed, uh, that uh, the, uh, in uh, the spring of 1942, uh, they removed 100,000, 70,000 citizens of Japanese origin, and they were sent to camps for two or three years. You know who was against that? Absolutely, very surprising. J. Edgar Hoover, not a noted civil libertarian. <laughs> uh, but he said, no, you don't have to do this. It is a big mistake. Don't do it. And the person for it, Governor Warren. Yeah, Earl Warren, great civil. He later said it was one of the worst things he ever did. So it had a, there were pros and cons, but they did it. Now, the case came to the court in 1942, because for the most part, the Japanese uh, families who were moved said, don't rock the boat, you know, you know, we'll just do it, okay? They didn't want any, they don't like by the boat, or they were concerned. But one of them, Fred Korematsu, says, no, I'm going to protest this. I met, I met Fred Korematsu about five years ago through a total fluke. He happens to be 
at the house of my neighbor next door in Cambridge. The neighbor uh, was the daughter of a man called Bezig, Ernie Bezig, who used to play poker with my father, and uh, he was the head of the ACLU chapter in Northern California. Now, he defended. He defended Korematsu. And uh, by the way, the, head L the ACLU wouldn't uh, give him help. Oh, yeah, it shows you at that. The ACLU appeared later in the Supreme Court. But initially, they wouldn't give him help. But Korematsu said, I'm not doing it. Fred, uh, uh, Ernie Bezig represents him. And Cor uh, you read what Korematsu says, great. He, he's sure he's going to win. He says, there's no basis for this. You can't just take 70,000 citizens and lock them up. The case comes up to the Supreme Court in 1944, long after any danger is passed. And um, court upholds it. Six to three. Certainly a decision that has been much discredited, that nobody thinks is good law. But the people who wrote that, by the way, Black, supported by Douglas, Frankfurter, the same who were on the majority in Brown. Why did they do this? You can say, well, they didn't know. They thought it was ill. Really? In the Justice Department, before that case came up, there were two lawyers, two lawyers, uh, uh, Burling and Ennis, and they got suspicious of this whole thing. And they said, what do you mean 793 instances of signaling, et cetera? Let's call in the FCC. So the Federal Communications comes in. They say, look it up. They do look it up. And so does the FBI. And they come back two weeks later. And the FCC has a bunch of papers like that. And they said there wasn't one instance of signaling, none. He says, it's all buck privates who didn't know how to work the equipment. <laughs> he says, well, 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 how did you do this so quickly? Oh, we didn't do it quickly, they said. This was done in 1942. And DeWitt knew it at the time. Same with the sabotage. Same with the sabotage. Now, they say we're not signing the brief. And then there's a big negotiation at the, at the Justice Department. And eventually, Herbert Wexler, who is the Assistant Attorney General for War, writes a compromise footnote, which is so obscure nobody can understand it unless you read it with a microscope. So they signed on to the brief. The brief goes to the Supreme Court, but the Supreme Court knew about that footnote because Charlie Horsky, who was representing the Japanese American Defense League, says to the court, read that footnote. When you read that footnote, what it means is there isn't a word of truth in the things that DeWitt has been saying. They read it. But still, six to three. So have, I read the opinions in the case, my own belief, Oh, by the way, Murphy wrote a dissent. I think that was Murphy. Nobody's ever heard of Murphy. But he was a very good judge in this case, I'll tell you that. He just went through chapter and verse bit by bit by bit by bit and said there's no reason for doing this. This is an outrage and so forth. And it's very, very, very calm but very definite. All right, so they read his dissent. Why? My own belief, which I can't prove, is what they're sitting there thinking is maybe they're right in this case. Maybe the Japanese are right. But somebody has to run this war. Now, it's either us or it's Roosevelt. And we can't. So it's Roosevelt. You see, I call that abdication. But we can understand it. We can understand why they did it. But it is a challenge. If we're not going to abdicate, how do we not abdicate? How? What is it not to abdicate that responsibility? at a time of real national security emergency. Well, here's where I try to make a contrast, because I bring in the four Guantanamo cases. And the four Guantanamo cases, each were cases brought by a person who was a detainee. And these were not the most popular people in the United States. I mean, one was Bin Laden's chauffeur. I don't think he's going to win a popularity prize. And in each instance, the court decided four the detainee, and against the defendant in those cases, who is the President Bush, the most powerful, well, probably the most powerful person in the country. All right, the court decided in favor of the detainees on habeas corpus, on, on what kind of hearing they have to have before you can detain them, on a number of different things. But if you read those opinions, as I've tried to write enough so you get an idea of what they're like, they're not too satisfactory. They're not definite. The civil libertarians criticize them because they say, well, you didn't go very far. You just said, well, Guantanamo is part of the United States, but what about uh, a base in Europe? And if a base in Europe, what about a base over in Afghanistan? 
And what about American base somewhere else? You didn't say anything about that. All you talked about was Guantanamo. What's the principle here? And you talk about a fair hearing. You just say you have to have an impartial decision maker and you uh, have to have uh, proofs and arguments presented. What about the hearsay rule? What about this other thing? You didn't say anything about that. On the other hand, the others are criticizing it. You've really cut the president off in ability to protect America. So nobody likes it. I like it. <laughs> Why do I like it? Because I'm thinking it at least shows something for present purposes. That what the court is trying to do is maintain some kind of check on the president when he acts in the area that is most his responsibility. And when people say, as Jackson said, this Constitution is not a suicide pact, he's right. At the same time, Justice O'Connor, who wrote a good opinion, is one of those four. She says, that doesn't mean you have a blank check, Mr. President. You have to watch what you're doing in terms of the civil liberty. So we have a kind of messy compromise here between two different approaches, two different sets of constitutional responsibility that come into conflict. And of course, the reason I want to write about that is I want you to see what can happen if you go all the way one or all the way the other, and uh, why. You can sometimes get a decision that may not be totally satisfactory, but nonetheless represents an effort to create governing principles. Anyway, I've given you an idea of how I'm going about trying to answer a couple of difficult questions. But overall, what I want to do is I'd love it if people who look at this or hear about it, and they do hear about it because sometimes I talk to audiences, sometimes I've even been on television. You say you're trying to sell your book on television. I say, no, I wrote the book so I could be on television. <laughs> 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 and, the, and the reason is because I want to get this point across. I want to get a, the point across uh, how strongly I believe it, and I'm sure people in different branches, anyone in public life, but also anyone who participates in community life, understands the importance of getting across to those next generations. What, what you say is say that you have to understand your government, you have to know a little bit of our history, and you have to be willing uh, to participate uh, in our uh, community life. That's the message. <laughs> Mr. Justice, I think you can tell from the reception how truly uh, we enjoyed your remarks and how much we appreciate your being here. And as a token, of our appreciation, I think you know that President Truman, to whom you referred, had on his desk a sign which has become famous, saying the buck stops here. Uh, from what you've said, we believe that the buck also stops at the Supreme Court, and we'd like you to have this, and if it's not the original one from Mr. Truman's desk, it's at least one of 5,000 replicas. <laughs> so thank you very much. <laughs> Is it true? I had heard the Chief Justice yesterday told me this. I want to know if it's true or not. He says the buck stops here referred to the fact that they used to have like the antlers of a male deer on a poker table and they'd pass those antlers around and then the dealer had the antlers in front of him. So it was the buck that stopped in front of the dealer, which meant he has to deal. Is that true or not? I, I, if a Supreme Court Justice says it's true, it's true. It's a knife, okay. <laughs>